So thank you very much, Madhavan Thru, for joining once again. It's been a long time since we had our last podcast, and we're looking forward to your association once again. So thank you for sparing your time and joining today. Hi, Krishna. Nice to see you. Nice to be here with you. So uh, shall we go ahead? Yes, please. Thank you. So I was thinking today we could discuss on the topic of sentimentality and spirituality, or from sentimentality to spirituality. <laughs> so sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two. Yes, bro. So, <clears throat> uh, I had thought of three things. Uh -huh. A broad three structure. If you have a structure in mind, I'll be happy to go along with that. Other, I could suggest mine, and then we could take it forward. And you know, I'm going to take inspiration from you this time. I'll also be making some notes. I saw last time you made noted some points. So, <laughs> so I thought of one thing is that. Now, how sentiments are first a part of spirituality, so that's so we affirm that, but then when sentiments can take us away from spirituality, especially we are talking about bhakti spirituality naturally, and then lastly, uh, how we can analyze our sentiments. So, are these taking me closer to Krishna or are they taking me away from Krishna? Okay. Mm -hmm. So. i had some concerns about the second situation when sentiments seem to be might be taking people away from krishna or but then it could just be me that i am a little more intellectual and analytical so it could be that i am i am a little less receptive to sentiments that might actually be authentic but i might be seeing them unnecessarily critically so I, I probably share with you, maybe because I also have a little bit of a scholarly nature, not like yeah. you, but something that I, I have a hard time with sentiment. And certain parts of the world, especially certain former Soviet areas, I yeah. find these very sentimental. And uh, as you said in the beginning, that that can be good; it can be actually beneficial, but it can also be very, very detrimental. to bhakti another point in that regard i i've had several people ironically or coincidentally in the last few weeks ask me what i thought about you know about, about uh, this thing when devotees leave their body everybody says oh they went back to godhead just because they're devotee they must have gone back to godhead and <laughs> this question was asked to me in a class just a couple of days ago and i thought for a moment before i replied and i told them Well, sometimes that can be beneficial for very sentimental new devotees. There may be some benefit in that, but that's not our general uh, mentality. I, I, I dug out this letter from Shiloh Prabhupada to Jayananda Prabhu, and let me read a little of that to you. It's it's very sweet. It sounds uh, sentimental, <laughs> but uh, Prabhupada's also a little sober. It, it, this is this is a letter Prabhupada wrote to Jayananda after Jayananda left his body. My dear Jayananda, please accept my blessings. I'm feeling very intensely your separation. In 1967, you joined me in San Francisco. You were driving my car and chanting Hari Krishna. You're the first man to give some me some donation, five thousand dollars for printing my Bhagavad Gita. After that, you've rendered very favorable service to Krishna in different ways. I so hope, I so hope, at the time of your death, you're remembering Krishna, and as such, you've been promoted to the eternal association of Krishna. If not, if you had any tinge of material desire, you've gone to the celestial kingdom to live with the demigods for many thousands of years. And enjoy the most opulent life of material existence. From there, you can promote yourself to the spiritual world. But even if one fails to promote himself to the spiritual world, at that time he comes down again on the surface of this globe and takes birth in a big family like a yogi's or Brahmin's or aristocratic family, where there is again a chance of reviving Krishna consciousness. But as you are hearing Krishna kirtan, I am sure that you are directly promoted to Krishna lok. Krishna has done a great favor to you not to continue your diseased body 
and has given you a suitable place for your service. Thank you very much. Your ever well wish for A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Now, I, I found this letter significant. I feel this letter, Srila Prabhupada's teaching all the devotees that his, their guru will always remember them and whatever service you do is never lost. And that when you leave your body, uh, as, as Jayananda did, Jayananda was considered to be the most advanced devotee in ISKCON by so many devotees at that time. And Prabhupada loved him very openly and appreciated him so much. He did such very important, significant service for Srila Prabhupada with Rathiatra, where he was a temple president in San Francisco. He, he, he did so many things for Srila Prabhupada, not, not to speak of what Prabhupada mentions, giving his life savings of $5,000 to print Prabhupada's Gita. But Prabhupada's saying that, that I hope you've been promoted to the spiritual world. He's not, to me, this is what he's teaching us as a society that we don't just, just because someone's a member of ISKCON doesn't mean that, okay, now definitely they've all gone back to Godhead, which I, I feel is a very Christian kind of mood. I, I grew up in a Christian family and that was always the mood. If someone's been, quote, saved, which just means they said a prayer, please, Jesus, accept me in your heart and forgive me for my sins. If they just said that, and in some branches of the church, they have to give money also regularly to the church. If they've mm -hmm. just done that, then they consider they've gone back to Godhead. And okay, as you were expressing, there's we have some sentiment in the beginning. And that sentiment may be favorable for some very neophyte people. Oh, anybody who joined ISKCON, anybody who's been chanting Hare Krishna, they all go back to Godhead. But if, as we begin to study the books more and we come to verses like Janma Karma Chame Dibyan, which Prabhupada quotes here, then we develop a little higher understanding, which Prabhupada is indicating he wants us to do. So I, I, I for me, this, is, this, this letter sets the tone of mood that we should have in our society about devotees going back to Godhead. Okay. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there are two things are there, Prabhu, here. I was thinking about that death is probably the time when we have to be the most sober. And uh, it's a matter of our destination afterward. And what you're saying is, is especially considering Prabhupada's quote, uh, to Jayanand Prabhu's exalted devotee, who is considered, as you said, an exalted devotee. So it does mean that uh, we sometimes... Uh, think that if somebody has not gone back to God, it's almost like a disaster. But maybe it's our own expectation. It's a progression and a devotee is always in Krishna's shelter and moving closer to Krishna. So, mm -hmm. so if we have set the expectation that we're going to go back to God, then that expectation not being fulfilled is disturbing. But if you understand that spiritual journey is more of an evolution, and it may, it may take multiple lifetimes for a person to actually attain Krishna. Mm. So, it's almost like sometimes we treat not only heavenly planets, uh, even the heaven, even Vaikuntha like our backyard. Oh, even only to Vaikuntha, we are going to go to, go to Goloka. So, I think there is a, there is a presumption of uh, two things, superiority and simplicity. Superiority because we are Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we are following Srila Prabhupada. So we are going to get elevated. And the simplicity that, okay, if I just do this, then this is going to happen. So I think that, so this, this sense of superiority and the sense of, now simplicity, I'm not saying in a positive sense, I think simplicity in a simplistic sense. Yes. So, and what you said about Christianity, it very much applies that sense we are saved. And this is all we need to do. And then we will be delivered. So at one side, we want to give consolation to devotees and reassurance in the process of bhakti works. But then how it works, especially at the time of death. Uh, if at that time, uh, we can't even really say categorically that somebody didn't go back to Godhead. Because how do we know? So we... Maybe at, that is not the time to actually give like a philosophical clarification or education. 
maybe it's at the other times in our regular classes where we need to provide this this appropriate uh, understanding of things because that is the time when people are emotionally vulnerable and uh, that can be very traumatizing and disturbing so so again this also raises the issue if somebody dies in a the devotee departs in a surrounded by other devotees chanting the holy names in contrast with somebody dies in accident uh, many devotees feel that that is a huge difference so uh, but uh, in this world just as some devotees may have healthy bodies and some devotees may have sickly bodies some devotees may become very famous and some devotees may not become very famous so similarly some devotees may die in a very peaceful serene kind of setting and some devotees may not die in a that kind of setting i don't think that itself uh, predicts the kind of destination a devotee is going to go to hmm. so yes go ahead just so let me conclude this point so what i'm saying is that sentimentality in a sense associates a, usually associate gives a lot of value to externals hmm. say the dt smiled at me when i went into the temple or said i saw the like one devotee told me that when i came to the temple hall i saw krishna winking at me today so <laughs> <laughs> so there is an over emphasis on externals and even going back to godhead is also seen like an external achievement okay you are here you gone went back to godhead so right those are my thoughts about this sentimentality yeah i was just uh, there's a verse that i was thinking about and if i can find it in that um it's two verses i'm thinking about but um one i won't find so quickly and easily uh rupa goswami speaks something about chanting in the in the bhakti rasamrita to sindhu and uh jiva goswami in his commentary mentions he says that if if uh krishna's really kind to someone then he makes that devotee take birth again and again even though they may be chanting the holy name for many many births <laughs> this is our philosophy he says and the reason is that so that that person will uh, come to the stage of prema otherwise if we just chant the holy name then we may go to vaikuntha which is not such a hard thing but to be able to go to goloka vrindavan to enter into the the, the, the kunjas of vrindavan that's a very very big thing and uh there's a nice verse too i can not finding it that um our chai i think bhakti vinod takra quotes this oh it's right here it's from adi purana it's quoted in hari bhakti vilas in uh, 11464 shadaya helaya nama ratanti mama jantava tesham nama sada parte varte te hridaye mama in my heart i always chant the names of those who with faith or contempt chant my name and there's another statement I, that i recall in shasha 2 that even if a devotee's been chanting his whole life if he forgets krishna at the time of death krishna will remember him so mm-hmm. i'm just mentioning this to underline your point that it's not such a cut and dried thing on the other hand going back to the uh, comparison with christianity i think that's uh a very important point because in christianity uh some scholars have said that that the teachings of christ are more similar to bhakti than any other tradition in the world and there's so many similarities between the two but as we see what prabhupad called churchianity yes. as that developed and things became more mechanical and people felt a need to make things uh more easily accessible or let's put it bluntly cheaper for people then they would encourage and everybody you know uh goes back to heaven who dies and whatever it is very convenient it's very useful for them and that tendency is what i fear in our society that that this tendency of making something being convenient and useful for the institution to collect members and to get money to just promise them some kind of cheap salvation that very much concerns me yeah you know that again there are uh, this is with respect to christianity what you said about jesus 
Now, when I read the Bible and then I read the Bhagavad Gita, I found that the, the Bible itself doesn't talk much directly about Jesus saving people. In fact, just believing in Jesus saving people. The whole Bible is more about you know living lives ethically devoted to God. So it does seem that, uh, as you said, many Christian, even Christian scholars say that there was one of the later apostles, Saint Paul. He shifted the focus from Jesus' teachings to Jesus' saviorship. Now, that's a matter of controversy within Christianity, but the idea that living living is important, but just believing is even more important. That is something which is um, a problem. Now, of course, we can say within our tradition. there is a significant emphasis on sadhana you know that you have to do this 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 but um, that can also become mechanical so overall if we consider that uh, the process of bhakti so there is like you quoted one thing that krishna will remember even if somebody doesn't remember so there's one side the assurance of krishna's protection Hmm? and that is important for every devotee even if the devotee be a neo neophyte devotee what to speak of that you know god's grace is available even for non those who are not even devoted to him but it is more i feel the expectation that god's protection or reciprocation will come in particular ways like the deities will smile at me or i will go back to godhead or say particular things that happened so i think that we at one side need to emphasize that god is always there god is in our heart krishna is in our hearts and krishna loves every one of us so that message shouldn't be also downplayed but at the same time we can't demand that krishna show his love to us <clears throat> in particular ways that we think are special or that we think are are transcendental so any thoughts on this that in you know, um there's a topic that that I, my guru maharaj used to speak about sometimes which i'd never heard any devotees speak about and more recently now i've been hearing uh bhakti vigyan maharaj and shivaram maharaj making some presentations on this it's described in madhuri kadambani by vishnu chakravarti thakur and also jiva goswami's bhakti sandarbha and uh, some prabodhan and saraswati's brinda uh, chaitanya chandra chaitanya chandra doya chaitanya chandra mrita that uh we the bhakti is independent and it's not even by our sadhana that that's a radical thing a lot of devotees think well, if i just do my sadhana then i'm going to be guaranteed everything but jiva goswami says no vishnu says no bhakti is independent and you may do sadhana for thousands of lifetimes and not get the sadhya unless you've gotten the mercy of the devotees and jiva is very clear about that in bhakti sandarbha that krishna himself doesn't give mercy but that mercy comes through the devotees and that is krishna's mercy krishna kripa shrimati so i also find that conception to be very similar to christianity that although the christians that i i find generally my christian friends they one thing they don't like about devotees they say well, the bible says it's not just by works only actually we also agree with that too and just recently we we finished the month of kartik and vishnu chakravarti thakur says there's significance in dwi angle the two fingers short that the rope always was one is that that indicates that that there has to be endeavor from the devotee to bind krishna and the second is there has to be divine mercy otherwise we can't do it I find it um I'm not so inspired by the Christians comments who say that it's not just by work only it's by mercy but then they say so you say what what do you do then well you have to say this prayer <laughs> you have to do this thing and which is a kind of work also that I surrender and I do this but we find that very beautifully described in our godia understanding that that bhakti is swarat bhakti is independent and we do this nam bhajan because it will attract the mercy of the devotee it's not that i'm chanting the hari krishna mantra and krishna's dancing with radharani and the gopis and the ras leela and all of a sudden he stops 
And Radharani says, what is it? And Krishna says, Madhavananda Ananda is chanting Japa. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Krishna is completely absorbed. But through Krishna Kripa Srimurti, through Krishna's form of mercy, through his devotee, I'm chanting. And the devotee becomes very happy. And that devotee is Krishna's manifestation and Krishna's inside man, so to speak, or inside woman. And that devotee, Sri Guru, can go and, and grab Krishna's ear and say, this devotee is so special and they please me by this kirtan. And definitely by that kirtan, we purify the heart. And by that kirtan, we, we develop bhakti. But through the stages that Rupa Goswami is given, a doshrada, the first we have faith and faith in what? In sadhu. And this, I think, is also crux of the point you're, you're, we're both expressing concern about, that when the sentimentality which is not based on, on, on serious faith. And we see there, there's a beautiful conversation. Let, let, me, let me share something with you again. This is something we printed before in our Bindu magazine. And uh, from our issue to, uh, 25, we, in an article, we called it, These Are Called Sahajiyas. <laughs> Very, <laughs> oh, I saw that you were sharing, sharing the screen at that time. That was the next article below. Yeah, so uh, it was a conversation from the 28th of January in Bhubaneswar, India, and Prabhupada is responding to some comments from some of his disciples about devotees having all these fantastic visions. And Prabhupada says, the first thing is, if this man who had the vision, is he attached to a woman? And if he is, then everything bona fide is finished. As soon as he's attached to a woman, either legal or illegal, all of his qualification is finished. So in other words, someone may be saying all these very far out things, but what's, what's the value of that if you still have material desires? Uh, there's another story I heard once that uh, someone came to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and he said, Guru Maharaj is, is this devotee and he saw Krishna, he's so elevated. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, Acha, that's very good. He said, you should ask him, does he still see Maya? Because if he still sees Maya, it means he hasn't seen Krishna. Beautiful. So this, is, this I think, is a real important consideration when we talk about the sentimentality. Let, let's go on. It's very beautiful, this conversation. Prabhupada's disgusted very clearly what he's saying. No one else has seen. Only they saw. <laughs> the, Prabhupada's being sarcastic. The other devotees, they could not see. He's so advanced and only he could see. This is bogus. You should never encourage this. This is bogus. That's all. If someone comes, everyone will see. And if only I see, nobody else can see. It's bogus. Don't encourage these bogus things. He's so advanced. Only his eyes are fit to see and no one else. This is bogus. Others also have eyes. But, oh, he's got transcendental eyes. <laughs> and Prabhupada goes on. He says, Many life members, big, big men, they come and they tell me things like, Swamiji, I've experienced this. Some boy came to me. <laughs> it means the real purpose is they want to prove they've already connected with a higher planetary system. Huh? And Prabhupada goes on. A little. He says, one big barrister, lawyer friend of mine, he's now dead, Mr. Chatterjee. He used to charge 16,000 rupees for an appearance in court. He was telling me that he went to Vrindavan. He met a boy and the boy was asking him for some sweets. He said, so I gave him a sweet. Later on, when I was coming back to Delhi, he said, I saw that same boy running on the train. <laughs> so he's thinking that, that Krishna has become a cowherd boy and he's running after you on the train. And it probably gives another example. <laughs> These are very beautiful. Uh, another friend's wife, she came to Puri, Jagannath Puri, and Jagannath Puri, rich men are allowed to go near the deity. So that lady said, when I was circumambulating, Jagannath was snatching my cloth. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Probably very sarcastic. He's saying, Jagannath became so attached with that blackish woman, he began to snatch her cloth. <laughs> so many nonsense stories. He's, why didn't you, at, why, I, 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 I want to ask her, why didn't you stay with Jagannath? Why didn't you, why did you come back? And Prabhupada says, these are very poisonous things. And Prabhupada very humbly says, I was never fortunate enough to experience these incidents. Incidences. Now, we could go through, there's a number of examples that Prabhupada did experience such incidences like this. Mm. But Prabhupada was hiding that. 
And in, in finally, in this conversation, Prabhu said, these sahajis will come out of so many devotees. What can be done? From my Guru Maharaj's disciples, so many sahajis came. These are called sahajis. Very easily they capture something. My Guru Maharaj used to say, when my disciples will become sahajya, it will be more dangerous. Now, you're a Hindi speaker and you know Sanskrit something, I think, and Bengali. For those persons who are listening who don't know, the word sahajya means easy. Yeah. And sometimes even the path of bhakti is described as sahajya by our charge because it's a very easy path. You just chant, okay. dance, be happy. But here Prabhupada's using that phrase, which sometimes I find we use it as kind of a prerogative term to anybody who wears white and lives at Radhakund or anybody that we don't agree with, just like we use the term Mayavadi to mean pretty much anybody who's not a Vaishnava. And it's not always so simplistic. I mean, sometimes those terms may work like that, but we, we use them in a simplistic way sometimes in our society. Yes, Prabhu. So, you know, these are very striking quotes. And uh, I would say that let's uh, look at it at uh, two, three different levels. I, I, no, anybody who has really studied Prabhupada's books and has understand Prabhupada's mood, it's unlikely that those devotees will say that Krishna came running to me when I was leaving from a train in Vrindavan <laughs> or, you know, Krishna was snatching my cloth. So, we would say that that is, that is definitely, it is easy for uh, even a general devotee to understand that this is a little bit going too much in a sentimental direction. But I would like to take two, three specific cases where uh, many devotees say that Krishna came in their dream or Prabhupada came in their dream. Hmm? That's one case. And uh, second is, say, devotees feel the hand of Krishna in their lives in particular ways. And then later on, they find that, you know, they did that thinking they were being led by Krishna's hand and then things don't work out right. Mm. So, <clears throat> now there can be many things in this. So I said, somebody wants to get married to somebody and they feel that some devotee astrologer tells them something and then they, they experience some remarkable coincidences and then they get married and then they find the marriage doesn't work out. They thought, was this Krishna's plan? What happened? So, you know, devotee sees Krishna's hands in certain events, which, which uh, I'm not really sure whether we can really see Krishna's hand over there. So one extreme example I remember was one devotee told me that his computer crashed. And he said, oh. I think today morning I chanted my japa inattentively. That's why Krishna crashed my computer. <laughs> so it can be in a positive sense. But it can also be in a negative sense, hmm. where you know, when I when I see problems coming in my life, I start seeing them as Krishna punishing me. So, hmm. so that would be a second level, and third level would be, say, some devotees say that the deities performed some pastimes with them. That this happened when we went into the deity room, and there are sometimes. Uh, Sometimes devotees may talk about that with the home deity. Sometimes they talk about the temple deities. So, the, would you like to talk about say these three things, maybe one by one? You you, you just press some buttons in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I know this can be a provocative discussion. I, I, I remember now. I was telling you in the beginning that maybe I don't have so much passion for this topic, because you have to have passion. A writer has to have passion. A speaker has to have passion. Yeah. An artist has to have. I remember I have a lot of passion. And let me share with you for a moment my background, why I have this passion. When I was 17 years old, and I was a big troublemaker at that age, I went and lived with my grandmother, who was in her 70s, and she was a born-again Christian. And she was a very enthusiastic born-again Christian. And she was always trying to convert me and get me to, to follow her practice. And she would watch some television shows, and she'd try to get me to watch them. And it Actually, when those television shows and her preaching had a very adverse effect on me. There was one show she used to watch, a lady named Catherine Kuhlman. And she had her hair 
like kind of straight up. It was very little funny. She would begin the show. The show was called I Believe in Miracles. And she would start to show it. I believe in miracles. <laughs> and every show, there would be people who would come and, and they would get healed of some tragic accident or illness or, or they were crippled or whatever it was. It would get healed of that. And once my grandmother forced me to go to a program of this lady, and it was held at the Oakland Coliseum in, in, in Bay Area. And Oakland Coliseum, I don't know, probably holds maybe 50,000 people or something, huge amount of people. And it was, I don't know, as I remember, it was practically packed. It was full of people. And she's down on the stage, and there's all these people with crutches and wheelchairs, <laughs> different things. And they would come up on the stage, and she would touch them. And all of a sudden, they'd start crying, and they'd jump out of the wheelchair, and they'd jump up and down, and hallelujah. And she'd be crying, and in the name of Jesus, you know, like this. And then I remember very distinctly also, they had these very big guys who worked for her going around to all the different rows, and they had huge buckets. You see my hands like, like this big, which they would pass down each aisle for donations, for money. And she was telling everybody, if you give more money, then, then it's going to be very, very auspicious. So that really scarred me. Aside from that, my grandmother, God bless her, she's a simple lady, but she, she had her miracles that she would share with me. And I'll, I'll just share briefly two of them with you. Uh, she told me once, she said, I was driving the car and, and all of a sudden it ran out of gas and I was in the middle of nowhere and I was praying. I said, Jesus, please help me. And all of a sudden it was a miracle and the gas gauge started going up and the car became full of gas. It was just a miracle. <laughs> this old lady telling me like this. And another time she told me that she had to, she went shopping or something. She had something to get out of the trunk, the boot of her car. And she went to, oh, excuse me. She went to get back in the car and the key wouldn't work. And she kept trying. And then she started praying, dear God, please help me. The key won't work. And what am I going to do? And then she told me, she said, I heard a voice from the sky. And the voice told me, Beulah, that's my grandmother's name, Beulah, try the trunk key. And my grandmother said, but that won't work. And the voice said, try the trunk key. <laughs> so she said, so I tried the trunk key and it opened the door. Oh, it was a miracle. So <laughs> I grew up with this Prabhuji, and it really disgusted me. With all respect to my dear grandmother who loved me, and, and I, she helped me in so many ways, it very much disgusted me. I found it very cheap, very sentimental, a little crazy. And so when I see sometimes devotees in our society, even writing books to be a little controversial, <laughs> writing books about deities, and saying, you know, some Muslim had a dream and the deity came to him in the dream and told him that you should marry your daughter to such and such person. And, and it was a miracle. And, and they're writing these things in a book. For me, the way that I grew up in spiritual life, Gopayat Guru Matmana, you hide your guru, you hide your, your bhajan. In, in Hari Bhakti Vilas, it says, repeatedly that if a devotee has some wonderful dream or vision, he shouldn't advertise that. And this is what you're pointing out. This is the, the danger, what Prabhupada's pointing out. Even if you have something, once a devotee came to my Guru Maharaj and he said, Maharaj, I was chanting Hare Krishna and I saw Lord Nishringadev. It was amazing. And my Guru Maharaj looked both ways and, and he kind of whispered to the devotee. He said, very good. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that devotee must have been disappointed the whole point is i want to tell something <laughs> and this is the problem i may have some vision or some dream maybe i had too much pizza before i took rest at night and maybe that's why i had that dream i don't know or maybe it's something transcendental but if it is transcendental i won't tell everybody about it I'm going to keep it secret, like Madhavendra Puri, who had an amazing experience where, where Kirchar Gopinath stole sweet rice for him. But Madhavendra Puri left in the middle of the night because he didn't want that respect. I, I, when devotees want to tell me about wonderful stories, and one devotee told me once, he, he said, I saw Gurudev Swarup, and he's Balaram. <laughs> he is? 
Balaram, oh. With big eyes. And, and I, I know, okay, I, 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 I don't mind. Really, I don't mind. Maybe you had that vision. But why are you telling me about it? I feel a little hurt. That's something you should keep sake secret. And if Krishna wants to reveal that, in some tricky way, he'll do that. The, the real problem is not that somebody has a vision or that they're inspired by what they think is a vision. Maybe it's not real, but they have inspiration. That's good. But if we go and tell everybody about it, then we're going to end up with a society like this lady. I believe in miracles. And, and by the way, I, I did some research about her years later. And they said something like 90% or more of the people who were healed within a few days or a week or two, their ailments, their problems came back again. And the scientists who examined it, they, their opinion is that it was just because they had strong faith in that lady. So what kind of faith is that? That's not Shastriya Shraddha. Mm. So, yeah. So, you know, faith healing is, uh, is a big thing in Christianity and it just puts off thoughtful people. I saw one video about an evangelical Christian. There was this lady who could use the money she had to gain medicine, to buy medicines for her sickness. But she believed that um, you know, she, if she gave it to a preacher, she would be miraculously healed. And eventually she died. So it seems her son has become one of the most prominent atheists <laughs> in, in America. So he told what he writes about, you know, like how we write, how we came to Krishna consciousness. They write how they became atheistic. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's saying is, has, like you also use the word disgusted. It's a strong word, but I understand so faith healing is uh, so so up from the specific i think you made a universal point i don't think uh, within our tradition we talk about faith healing as a sign of faith mm -hmm. uh, but what you are talking about is if you have had special experiences keep them private there's no need to talk about them so like you said if somebody has dreams of krishna who knows, you know, we don't know how advanced they are. We don't know how Krishna is going to reciprocate with them. So maybe they have a dream. Maybe as you said, they it pays are too much, whatever. But uh, by talking about these things in public, what happens is that everybody starts thinking that if this happens to me, then I'm special. And if this doesn't happen to me, then something is missing in my life. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is something deficient in my devotion. And I would say that is where things become problematic. So there are there is a standard process for practicing bhakti and growing in bhakti. And there could be exceptions that happen to individuals. But the more the exceptions are propagated, the more the exceptions will be will be considered the standard. Mm -hmm. And then if the exceptions don't happen, then we may even uh, there is a psychology a phenomena called uh, honest lies <laughs> honest lies means what they say is that uh, this happens especially when somebody writes memoirs they may write their life story and they may believe that something happened a particular way but it happened in an entirely different way so nowadays so there is a I think there's one famous memoir somebody wrote about the Chicago fire in I think it was 1940, something like that. Of how this person said, I was trapped in my home and then the fire workers came and rescued me. And then that book became a big bestseller. And then his sister or someone wrote to him saying that, wrote that he was not even in that city at that time. He was in another city at the time of Chicago fire. But he says, I remember it. So the point I'm making here is that uh, there are, this, this is what psychologists call as honest lies that we start believing our lives, we start believing our memories. So sometimes it may happen that our devotees is somebody claiming that I saw Krishna or something special happened to me. Is it, is it something really happened? Is it something which my mind concocted because I want it, because I want to believe in it? I want to believe that it happens. So that whole genre puts us in a very uh, dubious territory. So in that sense, so 
with respect to dreams it's best to not talk about them in public the same you would apply to say if somebody talks about dt's having special pastimes like you talk about that muslim thing so if you put both of these aside and what do you think about seeing krishna's hand in one's life hmm so it reminds me of a comment bhakti vigyan maharaj gave in a lecture i was attending in um ukraine when you're and he told the devotees he said that neophyte devotees they like miracles very much oh, okay <laughs> that gives them some inspiration devotees who don't have strong faith but we should develop shastriya shraddha faith which is based on shastra and someone may get some inspiration in the beginning and if it if it, it, it inspires them to chant hari krishna and it inspires them to worship the deity and practice krishna consciousness i i think we should support that and and, and be in favor of that and sometimes at book distributors we meet someone on the street who's been around the devotees before it's happened to me a few times and they said oh i i was chanting hari krishna and i saw this light or this thing or that thing happened to me and you guys are so amazing and what they're saying is very very sentimental but they're on the street i i always encourage them really oh my god you had that experience you're very special <laughs> just as you're saying because people want to be identified as special and shri lopramba pointed this out in this letter to jayananda i think indirectly to all of us that any service you do makes you special and prabhu is speaking about how special jayananda is because he did these services but then prabhu goes on in the letter to be a little more rigorous and a little more shastric and and we should see according to what what someone's state of consciousness is at the time of death i i also like your point about how when there there's always needs to be exceptions and i find personally in my life that i just my nature is i always like to point out exceptions because i don't like it when things are black and white mm. bhakti is not just gray but bhakti is multicolored and there's so many different variations and we like to point that out but there is some principle there is some importance to black and white also bhakti we know there's a my grandmother's once cited bhakti we know from sajana toshni or something we said that the definition of an upasampradaya uh, is when you take an extraordinary act of a great devotee and you make it a standard procedure that's the definition of an upasampradaya <laughs> and this is our concern that's wonderfully put this that that i i think it's wonderful if someone has a dream of the deity and i have no and may, i i'm not going to say the dream was real or not real only krishna can say that but it certainly must be inspiring for the devotee here's a little exercise you can do or anybody watching this can do i do sometimes with small children if they're a nice devotee they like to go to kirtan they really like krishna and maybe they're 6 or 8 years old ask them Have you ever had a dream about Krishna? And almost every time those little children say yes, and I say really tell me what was your dream. And I, I one little girl told me Krishna was dancing with me, Krishna was holding my hand. Uh, beautiful beautiful dreams. I think I never had a dream like that where Krishna's holding my hand and <laughs> dancing. Right. It's amazing. But so many of these children at least in this lifetime end up leaving krishna consciousness so mm. I, i would be a little shy to conclude that that she's a mahabhagavat devotee and and this dream is necessarily real and a higher maybe it is real on some level but as, as shri bhakti siddhanta said if you see krishna do you still see maya that's the real standard and and, and for me I, as a, as a preacher in iskon I feel this is a very very important principle. I one thing I found sometimes when you look in our Gaudiya tradition something the Gaudis don't are aware of always there's a tradition of uh rolling on the ground as a type of sadhana. It's mentioned and and, and I can I I was trying to find the verses just now I could send them to you later if you'd like or mm. someone wants they can ask me but I could send those to you. Actually I know it occurs to me how I could maybe find them. But uh uh that's a kind of sadhana 
that some devotees observe. And you can, uh, you can imagine that there's some utility to that by rolling on the ground. And what was being expressed was rolling out of humility. Prabhupada was also very discouraging about uh, people who very cheaply want to aver- want to roll on the ground and advertise something. And there's a famous story you may know that uh, some there was some man who came to a kirtan in uh, Krishna Balaram Mandir in Vrindavan, and he started rolling on the ground suddenly in the kirtan in, in apparent ecstasy. And here I found it. This is from the uh, this is from a book called Baba Sindhu's uh, Taranga. And it speaks about the Murdanga drum and the kartals and uh, also Ludana or rolling on the ground. And let me see, we're here about Ludana. Okay. Etavanti Dinani Kam I'll Sanskrit, but he says, Alas, I passed so many days engaged in fruit of activities. Bound, that are bound in karma, acting according to my own intelligence. By that, I've fallen far away from the father of the universe and have not been able to put an end to my misery. Therefore, today I behave as a child and dance with abandon as I raise my arms aloft. Then I cry and I roll around in the dust. Just see, will he not be merciful and take me into his own lap? So there's a tradition, a Gaudiya tradition, at least among some Gaudiya Vaishnavas, that raising the hands in the air is, is an expression like a child calling out for the father and crying and rolling on the ground in humility as being favorable to bhakti. But some people use that rolling on the ground to, to advertise like their, their kind of ecstasy. And again, I, I wouldn't say they're not ecstatic. Maybe they are. However, Srila Prabhupada at that time in the Krishna Balaram Mandir, he told the devotees, you should have kicked him and, <laughs> to see if he's really <laughs> ecstatic. And you notice, yeah, I, I wouldn't suggest the devotees take that literal and kick someone. <laughs> but the point was, I think, that if the person's actually in ecstasy, they won't notice being kicked. They're, they're going to be completely in and out of place. Oh, really? You, are, you can be sarcastic, bro. <laughs> Good one. Prabhupada is concerned about this. He was very concerned. He doesn't want these things to be taken very cheaply in our society. It's a serious concern. So, uh, therefore, it, it said that that, that uh, Gopayad Nijamalakam, we should hide our budget. Gopayad uh, Nijadevatam, we should hide our Easter day. Mm. We shouldn't advertise. We shouldn't advertise ecstatic dreams. These are injunctions given in Hari Bhakti Dilas. Oh, beautiful. Okay. You know, these are very pertinent examples. So could you maybe give some examples of what would be a valid see, valid seeing Krishna's hand in one's life? So at Thank our you stage, back. you know, what would be? Yes, I, I have a very quick, very appropriate answer, I think, for that. I see COVID epidemic as Krishna's hand. Really? Okay. Once we, we, he said, you should look for Krishna's hand. And we said, well, Guru Maharaj, how do you know it's Krishna's hand and not my Maya? And Guru Maharaj said, when there's something that you can't control, that's beyond okay. your control, you should see it as Krishna's arrangement. And that's how I see this COVID thing. And some people will say, oh, it's this conspiracy. And maybe they're correct. But those conspiracy, those persons who are doing the conspiracy, maybe it's the World Health Organization or the American government or Bill Gates or whatever it is, they're secondary causes. And the primary cause, the ultimate cause is Krishna. And I want to see that. As we spoke in a previous session with you, we told mm-hmm. the story about Gorky Shordas Babaji and how once in Navadweep, some children were throwing stones at him. And suddenly he stopped and turned around and started shouting in the direction of the children. But what did he say? He said, Krishna, you stop this right now, or I'm going to tell your mother. <laughs> so he's not seeing the children. He's seeing Krishna doing that. Now, that's a very high level. 
And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't chastise those children and correct them socially. But even though we may correct them, we should still think Krishna is sending those children. Krishna is inspiring those children. Why is he doing that? What is he trying to teach me? There's another example I could give here in Mayapur at the, uh, Ch at the Chaitanya Mutt. Once there was a, a, there's heavy storms that come every year in Mayapur and there was a heavy storm and the chakra broke off the top of the temple and there was some damage to the temple. And when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta found out about that, his immediate response is, what if some, some of the pujaris are doing something wrong? He said, this is Krishna's arrangement and we should see what, what, what is the purport behind this? There's something behind it. So we can, we can speak about in ecstasy about how uh, I saw Krishna, Krishna told me, you're the next Acharya, <laughs> or this or that. That's very convenient. <laughs> but let's be a little more pragmatic. Are we doing the same thing with COVID? Are we doing the same thing when I fall down and break my leg? Or when, when somebody, there's an accident and somebody pulls out in front of me and because of that, I break my leg and I blame that person. I'm very angry with that person. Do I see Krishna's hand behind it or am I seeing that nonsense person? And this is a test for all devotees and this, this is an opportunity for all devotees to go deeper in our bhajan. It doesn't mean the person's not at fault for pulling out of, uh, out of the stop sign at a wrong time or something. But we should ultimately see Krishna's hand in everything. Mm. And that's, that's not sentiment. That, 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 that's there. Krishna's controlling everything. I think this can help us uh, practically avoid so much uh, negativity, vengefulness. And there are times when sometimes we have to hold other person culpable. But in most situations in life, it is best to just forgive and move on unless we have either the power or the responsibility to actually do something about it. So they, so you're saying that when, when something, especially when something bad happens, rather than getting caught in the circumstantial causes and then going into either a blaming somebody or even blaming oneself too much, we see Krishna's hand and move forward. Well, let, let me, uh, elaborate on that a little more. It doesn't mean that, it, for example, if we see some person molest a child in the Gurukula, that we say, oh, anyway, it's Krishna's arrangement. But what we should do in such a case is mom can call the police and, and, and turn that person over to the police for, for being, you know, for go to jail. But then we should also think what is Krishna trying to tell us? Why has Krishna arranged this? Why, why has this happened? What is Krishna trying? What is Krishna's hand in this? We should always be looking for Krishna's hand. And that doesn't preclude that we that, that means we're not going to turn someone over to the police, or that we're going to be sentimental and throw our hands up in the air. And anyway, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to accept whatever happens. And the COVID is there. And some people are saying that the United Nations is saying that there's going to be an economic crisis and there's going to be world famine. Recently, the United Nations coming out and saying that. That doesn't take a genius to figure out. So we, we, we can just say, well, anyway, Krishna will take care of me. But maybe Krishna is going to take care of me by, by informing me through the United Nations that it's time to grow vegetables. Time to grow some grains. So we could put it that... Again, knowing when to say deal with a, a thing at a practical level and when to let it go, that also requires one to be somewhat unsentimental. If one is sentimental, then you, you in a sense, you talked earlier about being, if we are controlled by sentiments too much, we may see Krishna where it may not actually be there, but then those same sentiments or emotions may control our perceptions and prevent us from seeing Krishna also. So if I'm too emotional by nature, then I get too caught in, you know, this person did this to me, how dare they do that to me? And then again, we can, so we could say because of our emotions, 
sometimes we may see krishna where he is not there and sometimes because of our emotions we may not be able to see krishna where he, he need, we need to see him so and this is a very significant dynamic and i think this is the mood of the bhagavatam repeatedly parikshit maharaj doesn't talk about shringi doing it to him so much he says krishna has given me this opportunity to become detached so and uh, yeah so so also that gurukul example has come up repeatedly in the last maybe one month although i'm not traveling some of that question comes up that you know, we are not it's not that we just simply forgive or overlook but as you said that we do the needful but see krishna's hand what is krishna teaching us through this so maybe krishna teaches us that we should be more careful with the gurukul be be more careful who we hire what what is krishna's message doesn't mean that that krishna reign yeah in for that child sure to come because krishna's demoniac or something but it means that that we're stupid and we we hired someone as a gurukul teacher who we should have done I, this is an important part of our theology in chaitanya charitamrita there's a story of uh, i can't remember i don't think it was kaliya krishna anyway the, the mahaprabhu was serving when he was in vrindavan when he said can i have permission to go because everybody's going to see krishna dancing on the hoods of kaliya at night you yeah, know the think... story well, it wasn't the... bhattacharya yeah i think so Yeah. but it actually was just a fisherman it was some fish and, and some That's reflection true. and like that so why is that story told by krishna das kabiraj goswami to help protect our sampradaya from sentimentality hmm true so chaitanya mahaprabhu he himself ex- exhibited exalted sentiments and chaitanya charitamrita showcases those sentiments at the same time in that very book it cautions where the sentiments can actually uh can mislead us so you know we could also in a sense talk about say the tension between dharma and bhakti or we could say ethics and devotion that if our bhakti or what we think of as bhakti is interfering with our dharma our and dharma can be morality ethics or it can be just dutiful execution of what we are meant to do then that is what is to be stopped so chaitanya mahaprabhu even when he was in ecstasy when he heard a woman singing geet govind he was attracted and he ran but then i think his servant govind told him that no it's a woman and he stopped he said thank you you stopped me otherwise i would have i would have died i would not have been able to live so that means although he was in the highest levels of bhakti he also didn't want to transcend the sanyasa dharma hmm. so could we say that though that is the boundary that bhakti has sentiments but if bhakti but whatever sentiments come in bhakti if they start making us uh, if they start diverting us from our basic dharma whether it could be here i'm using dharma in terms of ethics or duty so in the case of say the gurukulis who are sometimes abused in gurukulis they say no it's all krishna's plan no that would be that would be irresponsible that would be sentimentally irresponsible on the other hand like prabhupada also saying that um, i remember another person prabhupada said that some person came and told prabhupada that i saw krishna in my dream yesterday and prabhupada in nonchalantly said then serve him today so <laughs> <laughs> so it's more like emphasizing on your duty rather than on being driven by sentiments yeah therefore we have vaidhi bhakti and therefore we follow the uh, order of guru and therefore it, when he speaks about these things in, in uh, hari bhakti vilas sanatan goswami he uh, this one verse which i could look up actually he says that if somebody has some kind of amazing dream or something they should have it confirmed by guru mm-hmm. uh, l- let me share the screen here again for a moment there's another astonishing verse you like controversial stuff this is really a controversial verse this is quoted by jiva goswami it's it's from hari bhakti vilas but it's also quoted in, in bhakti sandarbha sampadma purana 
is this Krishna speaking to Arjun? And he says, There is someone who does pop with sin, and they do it manimitam for me, then that pop, apidharmaya kalpate, becomes dharma. Whereas mama naditya dharma, if they, if they neglect, uh-huh, excuse me, they, 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 if they neglect me, mama naditya, then, then dharma becomes pop. Dharma pi papam sham not prabhavata. This is indicating a superiority of bhakti. But we have to follow this under the guidance of sadhu guru. Otherwise, mm. it, it becomes very, very dangerous. It is a dangerous kind of verse. But this is bhakti. And, and we see uh, Jiva Goswami, when he quotes this, he tells a story of Tirumangai Alwar, mm. who you may be familiar with. I who had the same a, story, yeah. Yeah, he had a gang of thieves and he stole money to build the, the temple in Sri Rangam. And that was his bhakti. But we should also point out that that was directly ordered to him by the Lord in his, in his heart. He had that real, I have to do this thing. So we can't, there's, there's a danger in self-appointment that, oh, I, I, I'm inspired by this. I, I want to go out and just solve, you know, save the world and stop, you know, ret- chastise all the demons and things. And as you mentioned earlier, I really appreciated your comment. You said uh, depends on, on our uh, power or our responsibility, uh, what our position is. And we can act according to that. That's Vaidhi Bhakti. That's reality. Someone who's on the platform of Raghunuga Bhakti, they don't even, they're not, they don't decide, well, I think I'm going to roll on the ground in ecstasy. <laughs> the story in Chaitanya Bhagavat, when Haridas Thakur started rolling on the ground in ecstasy, when he heard the snake charmer glorifying Krishna, mm. he didn't, it wasn't a mental calculation. <laughs> I think I'll do this as part of my sadhana. It wasn't, a, but he, he was just ecstatic. It just happened. But when that envious Brahman saw that, that was a calculated act on his part. So in, until we've come to that spontaneous platform, we have to follow the, the Guru and Sadhu. This is, so, you know, you, you've talked about how bhakti can take us beyond dharma or ethics. But that is again an exception. And Vaidhi Bhakti means Bhakti, we, we stick to Dharma in general. Dharma defined inclusively, not just as like mundane Dharma, but, but even devotional duties. So, you know, there are some incidents which... Uh, now, if I look at Prabhupada's uh, uh, first-person accounts, say, for example, what happened on Jaladuta? Now, what Prabhupada himself says... And what devotees have built around it, there is a significant difference. You know what Prabhupada says is actually quite modest. That you know uh, now, of course, I had talked with Satsvarup Maharaj, and he said that writing the first canto of the Lilamrut was the most difficult because uh-huh. you know that there are so many people who are coming and saying, "I was the postman who told Prabhu Swamiji you should write books, not magazines." <laughs> <laughs> so, like I was the person who did this, I was the person who did that. So, you know, Prabhupada, in a sense, never claimed, although Prabhupada said that uh, Krishna came in a dream and told him that when he was on Jalduta that he has arranged things. Prabhupada never claimed that dream as his authority for preaching. You know, Prabhupada said that his preaching authority came from the instruction of his spiritual master. So, so in that sense, even when a devotee as exalted as Prabhupada had some special uh-huh. dreams, he didn't emphasize them as the basis of his authority. He didn't use them ever to claim like privilege or special position. It was Prabhupada's, uh, in a sense, Prabhupada's defining characteristic was his dedication more than anything else, not his claim to special experiences. So that is an example which possibly we can all focus on when we talk about Krishna's uh, about uh, so we can see our the devotion is seen more in dedication than through some special experiences that somebody might claim to have had mm. the famous story was Shruta Kirti and Prabhupada he was traveling with Prabhupada and wherever yeah. they went the devotees would cry when Prabhupada would arrive and they'd cry when they left and Shruta Kirti was feeling sad. And one day he expressed his feelings to Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, I have no love for you. 
And Prabhupada said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, Prabhupada, I don't cry. These devotees like, and Prabhupada then said, do you like to serve me? And he said, yes, Prabhupada, very much. And Prabhupada said, that is love. I, I strongly think that the real dividing line in this, the, the real deciding factor is that these kind of things should be hidden. They may be encouraged, even with young devotees, because it, it's, it, it may be something encouraging. So I, I know I, I can tell you something secret. <laughs> when I was a brand new bhakta, I had a dream and Prabhupada came to me and it was a very realistic dream. And Prabhupada said, stay away from this woman, Maya. So now I don't know, it, was that a real dream? Was it actually Prabhupada or was that just some too much pizza at night or what? But that was very encouraging for me. As a new devotee, it really helped me. So why can't, as a new devotee, can't I embrace that? But if I were to go to the temple and start telling everybody, hey, Prabhupada came to me in a dream, there's something wrong with that. And let's turn to, uh, I want to share this. This is from Hari Bhakti Vilas. Swapni Vaksi Samaksham Va Ascharjam Ati Harshadam Akasma Yadi Jai Te Nakyadatkam Guru Vina. The devotee may have some swapna, which is ascharja, a very astonishing thing, but he shouldn't show that to anyone. That should be hidden. That's a very important principle in bhakti, both for us as individuals and for our society. Because as a society, if we start doing this, then, as Prabhupada said, then, then this sahajiism is going to go everywhere. It's going to be such a great problem. There's uh, another excerpt from a, a, a lecture, Srila Bhaktasi Bhante. And this is a very direct verse huh, that now what we're talking yes. about as a principle, <laughs> it's very clear and direct. Yeah, that's uh, very instructive. Very important thing. Let, let me share one more point with you. This is from a uh, Siddhanta. He's quoting Narutam Das Thakur. The Acharyas have ordered us, Apana Bhajana Kata Nakahi Bejata Tata. One should not disclose his confidential bhajan to anyone. And he goes on to explain, because if we do, then pride may come. And moreover, then, then other people will see, oh, this is the pathway. You know, Madhavananda became so famous because he started talking about how Krishna came to him in a dream. So I'm going to tell the same thing. Just like that, 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 that uh, envious Brahman in mm -hmm. the past time with Haridas Thakur. It's a very dangerous thing for society. For our, We have to be very careful. Maybe we can wrap up something now, Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhu, I know you have to go. So this is quite, a, I think, a sobering discussion. I would say a very unsentimental discussion about sentimentality. <laughs> <laughs> so You're the scientist, the spiritual scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that um, you have you have clinically operated like performed a surgical <laughs> strike today <laughs> on the suspect of uh, on the suspect of uh, sentimentality. So let me see. We discuss a lot of things, but basically, we started by talking about um, when we when when we talk about sentiments, it can easily. Um, it can easily divert devotees from the serious practice of bhakti. And then you gave a variety of examples. First, um, you also mentioned the article that maybe you could share that article. This is Sahajiism. And you started with before that a very sobering that, that death, which is the most crucial thing, Jayanand Prabhu's uh, departure and how Prabhupada is affectionate at the same time. He's not sentimental. I think that's an excellent model for us as devotees. Prabhupada exp expresses, he's writing to a departed disciple and he's expressing his affection, gratitude for the service. So Prabhupada is focusing on all facts that you did this service, you did this. And then Prabhupada very non, uh, very, you can say nonchalantly speaks about the various pathways. What may happen if you were here, you were here, you were here. So sometimes we create an over expectation and then we make it, like you said, it becomes very Christian. You have done this, then you will get this. So we need to avoid that simplistic conception of bhakti. And there is also the possibility that so, uh, there could be a sense of superiority in it. And then you talked about your experience with your, uh, with your grandmother. So how this faith healing, it just, it uh, alienates thoughtful people. And, uh, and as you said, 
studies actually showed it doesn't even work also so we discussed about say ext- extreme examples prabhupad refuting the idea that krishna came to running after somebody and they were leaving vrindavan but within the devotee community we talked about say dreams or special interactions with deities so or especially krishna acting in one's life so you said that the basic principle and later on you quoted it toward the end is that these can happen but there's no need to speak them in public that we can we can get them confirmed from our, our spiritual teachers you talk about that experience with your guru maharaj he said don't tell anyone and um, also while we are doing this the important uh, point is like bhakti you, know, you quoted bhakti you know, thakur also that the exceptions are possible but when exceptions are made standard that's when our sampradaya begins so we don't deny the possibility of exceptions but in the in the way bhakti has been taught in our tradition going back right to chaitanya mahaprabhu's times when chaitanya mahaprabhu refuted the idea of this fisher and seeming to be god seeming to be krishna as well as he hesitated when he was attracted to he was attracted to the singing of gopi of the gita govinda by a woman and he was stopped at that time he appreciated that so the overall idea is that in general we want to pra- practice vaidhi bhakti that means we focus on our duties whether they are uh, whether they are ordinary duties or whether they are devotional duties we focus on that dutifulness rather than some special visions if they come like you gave the example of krishna ke prabhupad came in a dream and said stay away from women that is beneficial so in a sense that is a dream that inspires us to do our duties better then that kind of dream we can accept uh, as anukul but many times they can be pratikul if uh, if that's the become the talking point and that's the way we try to claim superiority then everybody will start claiming that and then prabhupad never did that although prabhupad had the vision of krishna uh, in the jalduta but he didn't claim that as his authority he claimed his spiritual master's instruction as his authority and then also there's a lot of i feel maybe you could share links to this article the articles that you quoted many quotes are very va- valuable and uh, and where can we validly see krishna's hand that is also very instructive that when something beyond our control happens then like the covid epidemic or somebody getting an accident then we can see what is krishna trying to teach me through it that doesn't mean that we passively accept that is whatever has happened if say somebody has been a child has been abused in a gurukul then we have to do what we can to correct it especially if we have the position of the responsibility but even while doing that corrective thing we don't get obsessed in that particular situation we see what is what is krishna trying to teach me and for that we need to have a little more unsentimental thoughtfulness so emotion emotions can sometimes make us see krishna where he may not be there and sometimes emotions can block us from seeing krishna's hand where he is there so when somebody is hurt us we may become so resentful that we may not be able to see what krishna what krishna is teaching through us and i think that concluding point which you made about not being a about not i think that was a consistent theme which you also quoted in the conclusion that don't talk about your private experiences in public i think that would be the key take away that sentiments may be there we don't know whether they are there or they are authentic or not if don't talk about them in public and if they reinforce your practice of bhakti that's good I think those are, is that anything you want to add as a conclusion, Prabhu? Yeah, that's great. I, I, I'm always impressed, Prabhu. You, you, you have such an ability to remember everything and, and give such a nice synopsis. <laughs> Thank you very it's much. Krishna's mercy. So I can pay. I have a link here for uh, that issue of Bindu with uh, Prabhupada's statements about uh, this is Sahajya. It's inscribed. Uh, okay. On, it's, it's on his kind of desire tree, I guess. Um, is that where I should give you, or either one is fine? We'll just do a, a cut paste from that. Thank you very much, Prabhu, for your association. Thank Been you wonderful so and illuminating talking with you. It's a very important topic, also. So, look forward to your sangha again in future. Hare Krishna. Take care of yourself, Prabhu Ji. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Anshu Kapil Guru Vishnu. Anshu Kapil Guru Vishnu. Titanam Pavlim Pio Vishnu Pio Emo Namaha Hare Krishna